Good evening, everyone, to this two hours masterclass on ULINX, the foundation for digital railway transformation. I am Sumit Kanu, and I would be your host for today. I welcome everyone who has managed to take out their precious time to attend this two hours masterclass. Railway Academy is conducting this masterclass in association with New Wendy. And we have with us Mr. Abdul Rashid, Mr. George Hortman, and Mr. Smith Srivastava, who will be the experts for today's discussion. So uh, before we start with the webinar, I would like to take you through a brief introduction about Railway Academy for people who are joining our webinar series for the first time. So I'll quickly take a few minutes to uh, start with our introduction, and then we'll start the webinar. Thank you once again for joining us. So railway Academy is a, is a new age railway training organization. And we are, uh, we partner with uh, institutions, universities to offer postgraduate programs in railway signaling and telecommunications. We uh, also run 20 plus certificate courses around signaling, ramps, safety, uh, OHE telecommunications, uh, automatic train control, train protection systems, and our students are from reputed companies working in the area of railway sector. So uh, we also have a virtual academy which enables people to learn on the go. And we also partner with organizations to equip their employees with right skill set and new age skills related to railway sector. Uh, our training programs, uh, we, uh, these are the segments that uh, we operate into RAMs and safety. We, uh, we have course programs around Senelec standards, functional safety, RAMs, and data management for safety critical system. Railway application engineering, we have training programs on application logic, uh, Indian TCAS coverage, and MicroLog2. Our railway signalings, we conduct a very good uh, uh, advanced and exhaustive railway signaling course, railway signaling design courses. And we are also starting a new course on. Uh, competence requirement for detailed design phase, new south phase, basically a program on Australian signaling. In addition to that, we have a training program on EMI, EMC starting in the month of October. Uh, apart from that, programs on OHE, we're working out a program on project management, rolling stock, and we also offer IRSE modular exam coaching to interested participants. So these are uh, the, uh, these are, this is the list of our training programs. If you are interested in learning on the go, you are uh, you're most welcome to contact us. We'll be more than happy to share with you. Uh, training calendar for this year is that uh, you can take up a screenshot and also this presentation or the slide will be available in the recording session. So we're planning uh, 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 the upcoming training programs of Railway Academy would be on Australian signaling, EMI, EMC, RAMS, project management, rolling stock. In the coming months, we're planning to roll out these training programs. If you're interested, please contact us. Uh, free masterclass sessions. Uh, for example, uh, Ulinks, we are organizing a free masterclass today. The next class will be on RAMs, followed by rolling stock, then IRSC module, B and C module exam, and then tunnel ventilation design. So these are the upcoming uh, free webinars we're planning to conduct uh, from uh, September to January. So uh, you, you can register for these webinars at, uh, through our social media pages. Uh, Self-paced programs we are also operating, which is which is on-demand courses on uh, data management, functional safety, RAMs, railway signaling, railway signaling design, OHE, module exams. Uh, apart from that, we also help organizations in onboarding, recruitment solutions, and custom training solutions. So uh, uh, as a follow of uh, today's training, we are also working out a, a 30 hours online and live training program on ULIX. So organizations who are interested to uh, get into in-depth knowledge about new links and uh, model-based system engineering uh, can contact us. We'll be happy to work out uh, a custom training program for your organization with, in collaboration with New Wendy and their experts. Uh, you can follow us on, the, on social media. I'll also post in our YouTube link. Today's uh, session recording would be available on our YouTube channel and would also be uh, made available on our LinkedIn and Facebook pages. So. Uh, Please follow our uh, LinkedIn uh, 
page to know about our upcoming pre masterclass sessions. You can scan these uh, QR codes to directly uh, follow our pages. Now, uh, I would like to invite our uh, experts today, and we'll start with the uh, masterclass today. So, uh, before we do that, I have some important information to share. So, uh, if you have any queries related to today's masterclass, please. Uh, put your query or type in your query in the chat box. I would be the moderator and I will take up your questions during the session at appropriate breaks. We may go for a break at five minutes for five minutes at 8 p.m. Uh, after the presentation, we'll have uh, QA sessions, which is expected to last for 15 minutes. Around uh, 8 45, we'll uh, complete the presentation and followed by a QA session. A recording of the session will be available on Railway Academy YouTube channel. Uh, we'll also uh, share the recording link to your email ID. Thank you so much. And uh, it's time to start the webinar. So I would like to invite Mr. Abdul Rashid, who will start the session for us. And uh, before uh, starting the session, uh, I would request our experts to kindly introduce yourself so that uh, we, can, uh, we can start building a rapport with the participants. Please, sure. over to you, Abdul. Thank you very much, uh, Sumit. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome all. Uh, good evening to the participants from India. Good afternoon to my colleagues uh, in Germany. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Railway Academy and you, Wendy, for giving us this opportunity to present your links. So first thing is I would like to share my screen. You can see, right? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Yeah, so welcome. So today we are going to talk about U-Links. As you must have seen the, uh, the description. So U-Links is basically the standardized interface. U-Links defines standardized interfaces for future digital railway control command and uh, signaling systems in Europe. And it is also being used outside Europe. And we will have a, a deeper look at this. So in today's webinar, uh, we are going to talk about, let's say, a team from Neo Wendy and introduction to Ulinks uh, architecture framework and the model-based system engineering aspects involved in Ulinks and history and background of Ulinks and why was Ulinks introduced first of all in Europe, for example, and the Ulinks architecture and the standardized interfaces. So the different types of standardized interfaces and what is being specified in these interfaces, etc. Then we will have a deeper look into Ulinks modeling and the Ulinks modeling framework. We call it, we have MBSC uh, framework, the model-based system engineering framework. Then we talk a bit about RASA protocol, which is the underlying protocol on top of which Ulinks has been designed. Then a reference CCS architecture. So this is the railway architecture that uses Ulinks. Then we have a look at the tools and applications that we use for modeling uh, systems in Ulinks, RCA. Uh, then we also look at the validation and verification processes, uh, how it's being done, what are the methodologies, what are the, the, te uh, the techniques that we use for validation and verification. Yeah, so who is Neo Wendy? So we are one of the largest and successful independent consultants for a, a railway in, digital railway interlocking and infrastructure in Germany. So we, pro, we provide support for specification documents, standardization projects, European standardization projects, etc. And we have majorly four departments in Neo Wendy. So the first one is the digital transformation, which involves you know, the migration from the legacy systems to the digitalized systems and interfaces. And the next is the research and development department where we, have, where we develop applications for automation, especially in the railway domain, where we automate uh, the verification task, the validation, and especially the model transformation task, for example, model to model transformation, et cetera. Then we have railway projects department where we deal with the European projects. So we as Neo Venti represent, uh, let's say the infrastructure managers in Europe, for example, Deutsche Bahn is an infrastructure manager in Europe and we represent uh, infrastructure managers on European platforms. 
And we have MBS training department, which deals with trainings, you know, for trainings based on ULINs, for example. And we have, uh, uh, let's say, introductory trainings, in-depth five-day trainings for model-based systems engineering and the tools that we use. And how the tasks are aligned between these departments are, for example, uh, as you see, the research and development technology is well aligned with testing and trials. Also the lab-based testing, also we have a field-based testing. So we also have a collaboration with the German infrastructure manager, Deutsche Bahn, and we have a test site in one of the remote areas uh, in Germany. And when it comes to requirement specifications, we are well aligned with the international standards. To be specific, I would say the European standards, the European norms, the Senelec standards. Then we have procurement and commission of equipments or field elements and uh, corresponding technologies, which are being used for various projects in Europe. So one such example is a digital command control and signaling. We call it digital Schiene Deutschland uh, for uh, German infrastructure Deutsche Bahn. And apart from that, we have didactic implementation team, design of training programs, training and qualification. And we also have a, a, a planning of a test sites, also the uh, setup of laboratories for railway uh, equipment. Yeah, so this was a quick overview of uh, Neo Wendy. Now I would like to introduce my team members. So maybe I quickly have a look. So, First of all, uh, Georg, let me check if Georg is online. Just a moment. Okay. Georg is not here with us, so I would like to invite uh, Randolph is also not uh, huge uh, join soon. Uh, Guido. He is here, he is oh, here, I'm Randolph. here. You're here. <laughs> Great. <to see> you. <laughs> good, good evening or good afternoon. I don't know. In India, I think it's evening at the moment. No? Right. Ah, yeah. Okay. Then good evening altogether. Maybe yeah, you give us a short Randolph. introduction. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. My name is Randolph Dertlener. I had been or oh, I have been in the railway sector for more than 40 years. Now uh, uh, I'm working for Neo Wendy, supporting so here in, the, in this domain and mostly engaged now in model-based system engineering, formal methods. Uh, I was uh, involved in u uh, since the beginning. Yeah, and I hope I can support you in this field. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thanks, Guido. Yes, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you for participating. My name is Guido Holbemann. Uh, I'm um, not too long in the railway business. I just uh, recently started, actually. And um, I'm, I'm coming from the uh, sales, marketing, and project management uh, side. And I'm, I'm initiated a little bit this, this uh, meeting together is uh, Railway Academy and uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to see the outcome of this meeting. Have a nice, uh, enjoyable meeting. Thank you, Guido. Then we have Smith. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Smith Shavastov. So I also work uh, along with Abdul and Randolph. So I work as an external consultant for Deutsche Bahn, who is basically the German infrastructure manager. And my major expertise is into model-based systems engineering. So we kind of do these, uh, we basically uh, do a lot of MBSE activities for different research and innovation projects like u at the European level. And we are also uh, con conducting, you know, uh, MBSE trainings for different uh, 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 railway, app for different, uh, you know, railway participants. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Smith. Uh... Last but not least, my name is Abdul Rashik, as you all know. And um, so I'm again, external consultant for, I work with the uh, new Wendy game uh, since 2019. And since last five years, I'm in the railway domain, uh, working closely with the German infrastructure manager, Deutsche Bahn. And I represent Deutsche Bahn in multiple European projects, such as uh, U-Links, RCA, shift to rail and my specialization, again, is an application of MBSC and formal methods in railway command control and signaling. 
So since last five years, I'm in the railway uh, domain, uh, especially in the CCS uh, part. And before we get into ulinks, I would like to introduce a few terms because uh, some few terms, you know, I don't know how this is being addressed in different parts of the world. So I would love to give you the terms that I'm going to use in today's webinar. So as you know, infrastructure manager uh, is, and we have a railway operator, for example, who runs the train. So infrastructure manager who owns the, everything that you see on the railway track. And railway operator is the one, for example, it can be a one who owns the trains. Then we have supplier or manufacturer. And then we know you have the, we have the railway infrastructure. So how are they related? So the infrastructure manager owns and maintains the railway infrastructure. So starting from light signals, the level crossing, etc. So one example is uh, Dutch DB Nets AG, so is from Germany. And the railway operator uses the infrastructure and supplier or manufacturer supplies equipment systems needed for signaling command CCS for the railway infrastructure manager also uh, contributing to the railway infrastructure. Then we have a railway signaling systems, which is a part of railway infrastructure, not complete. So this is a part and CCS is a part of railway signaling systems. And projects like Ulinks is a research program focusing on command control and signaling part of the railway infrastructure. So this is to just to give you an idea where we are in the railway infrastructure and also what we are dealing with. So if you see this picture, so we are a small portion in the railway signaling system. And these are the research and innovation projects focusing mainly on the command control and signaling. So when I say infrastructure IMs in the upcoming slide, so it refers to the infrastructure manager and likewise. Now, what are the current challenges that are being that we face? Uh, I can talk about Europe. Maybe you, I would presume that it's uh, across the world as well. So we have diverse technologies. Uh, you know, we have various types of systems. You know, maybe forty years old system, thirty years old system. Now, what what about the future? How are we going to uh, put these system together for let's say 10 years from now. And now the cost of modernization, as you know, old even, even now some of the interlocking systems, are the size of, it's big compared to the state of the art machines or let's say the digital interlocking systems that we have. And the number of CCS centers that we have in Europe and also all over the world is increasing day by day. And apart from that, we have something very critical for us. So let's say, in Europe, 75% uh, of the domain experts, or we can call the red key holders, will retire within the next 10 years. So how are the railways prepared to face these challenges? You know, uh, in next 10 years, 75%. So how are we going to deal with these problems? And, you know, the technology evolves day by day. So in order to focus, in order to overcome these challenges, that's where projects like Ulinks comes into the picture. So what is Ulinks? So Ulinks is an initiative from three, 13 railway infrastructure managers across Europe. So starting with the infrastructure manager, you know who, who is an infrastructure manager now? So who owns and maintains infrastructure in particular region or particular country? So Bananor is from Norway. So CFL is from Luxembourg. So DB Nets, of course, from Germany. Infrabel is from Belgium. Wildlife from Finland. Network Rail from UK. OBB from Austria, ProRail from uh, Netherlands, uh, SBB from Switzerland, SNCF from France, RFI from Italy, and Slovenske Zelens from Slovenia, and Traffic Verket from Sweden. So these are the infrastructure managers who are members of ULINS. And these infrastructure managers have come together to define standardized interfaces. Now, what is Ulinks? As you know, it's an initiative. So what do we do in Ulinks? So Ulinks defines internationally standardized signaling systems. Not systems, I would say the interface between the systems. And it mainly focuses on common standardized interfaces. So Ulinks contributes to the continuous development, maintenance, change management of the standards. And Ulinks interfaces or what Ulinks specifies are purely based on standards. So we, we make use of European standards, European norms, as well as the Senelec standards. We will try to understand a bit before going into Ulinks, 
let's say let's understand how the ETC, uh, let's say the European Train Control System, or we call it ETCS. I think many of you know about it. So the European Train Control System is a signaling and control component of the European Traffic Rail Traffic Management System (ERTMS), uh, which basically replaces the legacy, legacy train protection systems designed to replace many incompatible safety systems currently used by the uh, European railways. And uh, as far as I know, uh, ETCS is being used not only in Europe, but also in other countries, so for example, Australia, uh, even in India, I know uh, there are countries using uh, ETCS, Scotland, Ireland, many countries use ETCS. And in ETCS, we have four different levels. So ETCS level, level zero is basically what we call non-ETCS. So even if an ETCS compliant locomotive runs in this ETCS uh, area, uh, non-ETCS uh, area, uh, it is considered as ETCS level zero. Then we have ETCS level one, ETCS level two, and ETCS level three. So what is ETCS level one? So in ETCS level one, we have, uh, I hope you all, I hope that uh, the participants know about interlocking systems that controls rail traffic. Uh, that's called the, the, we call the brain of the railway signaling. So we have a light signal and let's say uh, we have interlocking. So interlocking commands the light signal so that the train, uh, the movement authority can be allocated, it uh, can be uh, assigned and the train can pass through. Then we have Eurobalis that reports the, the train location, the state of the signals, et cetera. So one major uh, significant aspect of ETCS level one is that there are light signals to control the movement of the trains. Then, in, then comes ETCS level two. So if you see the major difference, so one that major aspect that is missing is in ETCS level two, you do not have the light signals for to control the movement of the train. So how does it work? So ETCS level two works with, as you know, interlocking. Then we have something known as radio block center that communicates with the train. So it sends the track data, then it sends the position reports back to the RBC and the RBC communicates with the interlocking. And again, the Euro Belize report, uh, sends uh, the train location. And one interesting aspect is that in India that we have uh, from Indian railways, there's indigenous system, or let's say uh, that is equivalent to ETCS level two, that's something called the TCAS systems. So the train collision avoidance systems. It works in a very similar manner. So ETCS works with Belize and the TCAS systems uh, work with RFID readers. So in order to read the train position, it uses RFID readers and RFID systems. And instead of RBCs, it uh, uses radio frequency antennas to communicate with the interlocking. Very similar, but this is basically defined for the Indian railways and Indian uh, uh, market, uh, very, very much equivalent to ETCS level two. Then comes ETCS level three, where you can see now we do not have also RBC. So the train communicates with other trains based on a central control system. So the track data and the person report is communicated from the train. And with ETCS level three, interesting um, uh, aspects could be the, the moving block technology that increases the capacity of the train running on a train. So uh, the space between two trains are determined by the speed of the train and the braking distance is also determined by the speed. So higher the speed, the higher the braking distance. So lower the speed, smaller the braking distance. So this is ETCS level three, which is being investigated. And we have various tests happening uh, in Germany for ETCS level three, also in our test field in Germany. So this was about uh, the rail ETCS, European Train Control System. Now coming back to U-links. So as you know, in railway signaling, we have interlocking, we have various elements on the field, such as level crossings, point machines, and uh, RBCs, uh, train detection systems, et cetera. Let us consider a very good example. So now you know who is a supplier, who would manufacture and supply the equipment. Let us say we have two suppliers, supplier A and supplier B. So supply A provides interlocking, then we have a level crossing, a light signal, and a point machine from. Uh, supplier uh, A. Of course, these systems can communicate with each other because they are being manufactured by the same organization. So this is how it has been happening in the past, even today. So a supplier provides with interlocking and the elements that communicate with interlocking are dependent on this interlocking. Let's say we have another supplier, supplier B provides us with a similar 
systems and of course they can communicate with each other so this is what uh, this is the past and this is the present how systems integrate but let's say if i want to uh, use I, I determine that interlocking is the best suited for uh, for german market for example so this is a possible solution and i want to use a level crossing from uh, let's say a different uh, supplier currently it's not possible because the interfaces that can, helps us to communicate with the systems are not compatible with each other. So the suppliers, they have their uh, respective uh, communication interface, which is not possible. And what uh, this brings us to Ulinks. So what Ulinks does is, you know, when we talk about standardized interfaces, irrespective of the supplier, the interlocking system can communicate with, communicate with the level crossing. So this is being specified by the Ulinks. So Ulinks basically, uh, defines the interface, uh, specifies the interface for communication. A very good example, what I can relate to Ulinks is uh, USB standard. As most of you know about the uh, USB, uh, let's say we have a laptop and we have a mouse. So it is nowadays it is not necessary that the laptop and the mouse has to be from the same manufacturer. I could use uh, right now. I'm using a Fujitsu laptop communicating with uh, my Logitech mouse. Very similar to, similar to that, we have a plug and play concept introduced by Ulinks, in which uh, we are not bound to one vendor for our interfaces, or let's say for our signaling systems. Yeah, so what are the objectives of Ulinks? Yeah, so Ulinks defines this modular signaling architecture with standardized interfaces. So it separates the life cycle. So as you can see in the previous slides, so the life cycle of my level crossing is no longer dependent on the interlocking. For, for example, in, uh, for supply, supplier A, if I choose to replace the interlocking from, uh, in, our, in my site, I will have to replace the level crossing, also the light signal, and also the point machine, which is compatible with the latest interlocking. But with the introduction of Ulinks, it's not necessary. So we separate the life cycle of individual systems, and it's no longer dependent. And in this way, it reduces the vendor lock-in risks when upgrading or renewing installations, enables overall reduction of lifecycle costs. Of course, as you know, the maintenance can be done separately. And it opens the market and increases the competition. So especially for the maintenance, usually the contracts are for a very long period of time. And as you know, the technology evolves every day. So we cannot be using the same technology for let's say the next 15 years. Maybe I want to renew my, upgrade my technology after five years. So this is possible with Ulinks. And it provides industry with precise and unambiguous specifications. Major activities of Ulinks, it maintains uh, and uh, uh, applies uh, Ulinks standards, that migration of Ulinks standards and reference architecture with evolution of signaling technologies. So we'll talk about RCA, how it is related to Ulinks. Further harmonization and standardization. So it creates a standard for all the infrastructure managers. So when all infrastructure managers come together and that, let's say, okay, this is the standard that we want across Europe. So the suppliers would manufacture their systems based on this Ulinks standard. And Ulinks also supports testing and certification of system based on Ulinks standard. Also, we support national implementations and dissemination of uh, Ulinks standards. Let us have a brief comparison about you know, the, what is the current situation and what Ulinks introduces. So what are the possibilities? So if you look at the availability of a common architecture, currently we do not have a common architecture across Europe or let's say across the world. We, so basically now I will talk more about Europe because Ulinks is currently focusing in Europe. So we do not have a, co a common architecture, but with Ulinks, we have defined a standard architecture that will be followed across all infrastructure managers. European standards are weak and incoherent. So of course, the standards tell us what are the things to be covered, but we do not have, a, let's say, a standard that tells us what must be specified in the interface. So what Ulinks does is it has come up with a plug and play concept. So it has implemented the Ulinks standards and it's, it's ready for plug and play. Formal methods. So formal methods, I would say I would define formal methods uh, using mathematically rigorous techniques and tools for specification, design, and verification of software hardware systems. So this is we use uh, because in the current situation, it's at very early stages, but in Ulinks, it has been established and it, it, we do for, uh, verification with formal methods. 
and time to market. So it's in the current situation, it is not transparent and it's hardly predictable. But in, with the help of Ulinks, we have success, uh, pilot projects are in, uh, have been completed successfully. And once we separate, uh, let's say with the help of MBSC, the time to market has been significantly reduced because uh, we determine the errors or detect, uh, detect the errors well in advance in the design and system uh, phase. Yeah, we already discussed about the life cycle. So in the current situation, uh, the life cycle of uh, the railway signaling is imposed by the interlocking lifetime. But with the help of fuelings, it's been it has been separated, and we have independent lives because I can choose if I want to replace my level crossing only without affecting my other infrastructure uh, in the field. So. Considering all of this, in the end, what we have are the life cycle savings. The cost is reduced, the time is reduced. Eventually, uh, the cost, overall cost has been significantly reduced. Uh, now coming to the Ulinks architecture. So, as you can see, the core of the Ulinks uh, is interlocking systems and surrounded by the interfaces. So we call, uh, we have specific names assigned to the Interface, for example, the interface that can, uh, that connects interlocking to the adjacent interlocking, we call it SCI ILS. So SCI basically stands for standard communication interface, and SDI stands for standard diagnostic interface. So standard communication, <coughs> sorry, excuse me. So SCI covers all the functional aspects that must be that is that are needed for communicating between the two interlocking. So the functional aspects. And SDI consists of the diagnostic messages that must be communicated between the systems, and SMI uh, is the standard maintenance interface. This, defi uh, this interface defines the maintenance data as well as the configuration data. As you know, nowadays all systems are controlled by softwares. So for software industry, we have configuration data, maintenance data that must be updated regularly. So S SMI interfaces help us to update these configuration data. Then we have the interface between, as you saw in ETCS level two, the radio block center. So Ulink specifies the interface. One thing that you must be, uh, pay attention is that Ulink specifies the interface, what, how the messages should be exchanged between the interlocking and the RBC, for example. But Ulink does not uh, specify the internal behavior of the interlocking. So this is a black box for Ulink. But how the messages are exchanged in the interface, this is what Ulink specifies. Then we have the interface between the light signal, so SCI LS. Then we have the level crossing interface, SCI LX. And then we have the point machine interface, SCI P, then SCI TDS for train detection systems, the input output, then uh, the track worker safety system. So some of the activities uh, are system architecture, as we discussed, modeling and testing, data preparation, assurance, security, variability management. So this is a very important aspect in Ulinks. So as you know, Ulinks is uh, for 13 infrastructure managers, and it defines the interface which is compatible with all infrastructure managers. So you might ask, OK, there could be differences for requirements for, let's say, between two countries. So Ulinks addresses this with the variability management. So we have infrastructure manager codes integrated into the system. So we can define what requirement is applicable. So there's a, there are a set of requirements applicable to all infrastructure managers. Let's say, uh, I would say the principles may differ. Uh, I mean, the principles are the same, but how it's being implemented can differ from country to country. But Ulinks addresses this with the infrastructure manager codes. Um, so, uh, could you please uh, mute uh, if you are not, uh, because some of the participants here. Thank you. So this is the Ulinks system architecture. So as you can see, what you see within the blue boundary are within the scope of Ulinks. So everything outside the blue box are not specified by Ulinks. For example, here you can see the subsystem electronic interlocking. And here we have, you can choose, these are the interfaces specified by, there are various interfaces we call, we name them as SCI ILS, SCI LX, SCI RPC, et cetera. So this is what is being specified, how the messages are exchanged. And yeah, the three types of interfaces we have SCI. So as we discussed, contains processes and other in information necessary for exchange between the subsystem electronic interlocking and the subsystems. 
Then we have the diagnostic interface required for transmitting non-safety relevant diagnostic information and SMIs for the configuration data as well as the engineering and the software data. Now, maybe we would like to see how where these interfaces are. So if you look closely, so you can here, see here is the, inter, uh, the SCI, for example, for subsystem electronic interlocking and subsystem level crossing. So this is the SCI interface. Then we here we have the SMI interface. Then we have the SDI interface for diagnostic information. So this is communicate. This is exchange with the maintenance and data management. So this is MDM, and this is these are available in the Ulinx modeling standard. Yeah. Now coming to the standardized interfaces. Uh, so what you see now is the typical five layer TCP IP protocol stack. So if you are from the software domain, you, are, you must be familiar with the OSI seven layer model as well as the TCP IP five layer model. So here we have the five layer model of TCP IP protocol stack. So the PDI layer corresponding to the application layer. Then we have the Rasta layer corresponding to the transport and network layer. Then again, the UDP over TCP corresponding to the network layer. IP layer corresponding to the data link layer and the ethernet is the, the physical layer. So let's say we have interlocking and we have a level crossing. So now I want, uh, let's say interlocking wants to command the level crossing to raise the barriers. So we will see how the message is passed on from the interlocking to the level crossing. So it goes to the PDI layer, then the underlying Rasta layer, then the TCP layer, then the IP, then the, it goes from physical layer to the physical layer of level crossing, it goes up this way. And now let's say the level crossing wants to confirm that, okay, let's say the level crossing does what it's supposed to do. So this is what level crossing does to raise the barriers is controlled. It's not specified by Ulinx, but how the messages reaches from interlocking to level crossing. For example, with respect to the safety aspects and the security aspects. So this is a RASTA protocol. So RASTA, is a pro RASTA stands for Rail Safe Transport Application, which is specifically designed for railway applications. And it's again, based on a Senelec standard, uh, 50126, uh, I'm not sure, we, we have uh, the number later. So this is specifically designed for Ulinx and what Ulinx defines is the PDI layer. So how this message, so what on based on what, uh, what requirements the information is sent from the interlocking to level crossing. Now, now the level crossing wants to send in information back to interlocking stating that, okay, now the status of my barrier is up or raised. So this is how the information is passed on from the level crossing back to the interlocking. So it goes from the PDI layer, the Rasta to TCP IP goes to, yeah. So the PDI layers, PDI stands for process data interface is the application layer of the standard communication interface that is only specified by Ulinx. Again, uh, the internal behavior or the internal logic of the interlocking and the level crossing is not part of Ulinx, what Ulinx specifies. Then again, we have the Rasta protocol uh, based on which Ulinx is designed. So it ensures a safe transmission of telegrams. Even it also guarantees that information is, is not lost because sometimes, you know, in IP based communication, the information to the packets can be lost in between. So Rasta ensures that there's no loss of packet and it also acknowledges that the complete information has been received by the uh, recipient uh, system. And this is again uh, based on the European Senelec standard, so DIN uh, EN 50159. So this is the Senelec standard for radio applications, communications, signaling and processing systems. So you can see uh, Ulinx is purely based on standards. So we apply standards in Ulinx and we apply the phases that are being described in these standards. So when it comes to specifications, what are the major aspects that we need to consider? Now we know, okay, what is Ulinx? What Ulinx specified? Now you might ask, okay, how it is being done in currently? So for any specification, it must be comprehensible. It must be consistent whether we break it down into a, a smaller system, it must be consistent. It must be correct. It must be unambiguous. So these are the major aspects a specification system, a specification uh, should have. For example, eventually the specification is what you hand over to the supplier so that suppliers would manufacture the system based on the specifications. So currently what is being done in, let's say in the railway world is that the specification is based on natural languages. When I say natural languages, 
say English, Hindi or German. Uh, these, these are the natural languages we can refer to. But it comes with a drawback. Uh, of course, right now you can see the trains are running all over the world based on the text-based specifications. Agreed. So suppliers manufacture these uh, the system based on these requirements. But what are the drawbacks? So the question that we can ask ourselves is, how can you test the system if it is based on text? Can you, how do you identify errors in the specification if it is purely based on text? So that's not possible with the text-based uh, systems. However, in Ulinks, we do not use only text. What we use is something called the model-based systems engineering to specify the requirements, basically the specification documents. So this doc, these models, so we can, I, now, now from now on, I would refer, refer to Ulinks models. So the difference between the current specification and the Ulinks specification is that the current specification is purely based on text. So you need a human to interpret what is being specified and how, what is being specified or what is being specified. But in Ulinks, we have models. When I say models, this can be interpreted by humans as well as computers. This can be executed, this can be compiled, this can be uh, uh, transformed automatically with the help of uh, computers. Let us have try to understand. Uh, so now let's say uh, we have this text-based requirements and what are the dangers of unprecise specifications? Let's say now I have a customer coming to me and the uh, so customer explains his requirements. So this is how a customer explained it. So customer would like to have a uh, swing. Uh, and let's say now, this is how the project leader understood it. This can happen when you have a text-based requirement. These, these are very common scenarios. Now let's say how, this is how the analyst designed it. You see the differences. So what customer explained, what customer, what project leader understood, how the analyst designed, then how the programmer coded it in a software. This is how it's done. What the beta testers received for testing. Then how the business consultant described it. And how the project was documented. This happens very, very often, especially from my experience in the railway uh, domain. So how the project is documented based on expect this can happen. Then how operations install the, the product. And this is how the customer was built compared to what customer expected. And this is how the project was supported. So this is what the marketing team, uh, the marketing uh, advertised. And this is what exactly the customer really needed. But you see, once the customer needed this and the customer, this is how customer explained it. So you can see the drawback when you use a language which is not understood by everyone. This is, these are the things that can happen. But now in this case, what happens again is, okay, eventually when the product is created, the customer and the company realize, okay, this is what the customer really needed. So this process starts all over again. So again, the customer explained. So you can see the time. So the prototype is created, errors are determined. So errors are not determined unless the system is implemented and tested. So these are the drawbacks of text-based specifications. Let me give you some examples from the real world uh, in Germany. So this is a requirement specification document from Deutsche Bahn. Let's say we have a customer or let's say the one who the supplier is from India and he wants to develop software based on this requirements. Of course, it can, you know, we do not have a common language. He can build the systems, but how do you determine if there are any errors in the specification or errors in the system that can be, uh, that will be developed? For example, from Trafikverket in Sweden. So we have documents in Swedish as well as English. So. These are text-based. How do you validate the requirements? How do you test if there are errors in the requirements or not? Likewise, every country they have it in their own language. So SNCF is from France. Never know, it could be in French, it could be in English. So let's say if you're talking about the software, so what software developers receive is this text and software developers are not, let's say, not necessary that the software developer understands how railway systems work or the railway signaling system works. So these are the disadvantages of having a text-based requirements. But however, compared to the current one in Ulinks, what we do is we do not provide specification just based on text. But however, <coughs> 
sorry, excuse me. We, uh, in Dueling, we use model-based systems engineering to specify the requirements. As you can see, these are some of the examples of how it is being specified in Dueling. Later, we will open up uh, Dueling specification requirement and see what are the contents. So you can clearly see the difference between a traditional requirement document or let's say the Ulink specification document. So you see some of the diagrams, we call them as SysML diagrams. So here you have a sequence diagram and a state machine diagram explaining the behavior in a precise and unambiguous manner. Also supported with text that supports the, that self, self-explanatory text that explains what is what are the exchanges that are being happening between two systems. So if you talk to a software developer or a systems engineer, he will clearly, he or she will clearly understand what a sequence diagram is, what a state machine diagram is, because it's not rocket science to understand the state machine. It's simple, easy to understand and easy to interpret. And other advantages that, these diagrams can be interpreted with the help of computers. So we can compile them, we can execute them, we can transform them, you name it, you can do it. So this is, let us take a very simple example. So this example is uh, from the Ulinx modeling standard that has been published in the Ulinx website. So let us look at a very informal description of a functional requirement. So the system shall switch on light if the light is off and the button is pressed, for example. And this is, let's say, uh, one of you are uh, software developers, and this is what you receive. So what first thing that you would do is you will start developing code. You will start writing the software based on what you receive in the text. And I'm sure there would be errors. There would be bugs, which will not be identified until the software is implemented. So the threat to here is that it could, it, there could be an ambi it could be an ambiguity. The, uh, the result is incompatible. There could be technical errors, incompatible technical solutions. But however, in Ulinks, we use a semi-formal approach. So we call it SysML model, or let's say a SysML language. So SysML is an extended version of a UML standard, so unified modeling language. Let's say same requirement as you saw earlier, so which is based on text expressed in terms of uh, diagrams. So on above, above, we have a use case diagram, we call it. So we have two actors, button and a light. And we have a use case called switch on the light. So we, we can clearly see the system boundary. What are the actors? What is my system supposed to do? What is my system supposed to accomplish? It's clear. And with the help of, you know, let's say, a sequence diagram. So uh, let me tell you, there are multiple diagrams. You know, we use specific diagram based on what we actually need. So now I want to see how the behavior, how my system reacts or responds. So if you know about system diagrams, you must be very familiar with the meaning of each of the uh, symbols or the boxes that you see. So we have two actors. So we have a button, we have a light. So when the button is pressed, so SysLC responds back and it switches on the light. So this is what is Ulinx does. So if you open any Ulinx requirement a specification document, you will see diagrams like use case diagrams, state machine diagrams, or sequence diagrams. And it also explains the interactions. See, for example, the light controller receives a request when button pressed from actor button. So it is not very difficult to interpret these sequence diagrams compared to only textual documents as earlier. So, the advantage here is that we can validate these diagrams with the help of computer applications. We have specific applications to perform this task. So we could uh, simulate the state machine diagram, we could execute this, and we can also extract the underlying, let's say we can also perform the code generation. So we can also uh, generate C code or let's say C++ code from SysML models, it is possible. In the case of text, it's not possible to generate code from text or generate a simulation based on text. Yeah, and also now I want to see how my system behaves inside. So I had, this is what I call a block definition diagram. So here is my system. So the input to the system comes from a button. So it's a stimulus and the output of the system is, uh, it goes to the light. So this is the response. So it has a stimulus response behavior. And this state machine describes the behavior of my system. So initially my system is in off and when button pressed, my light is switched on. So my system moves from off, on, off to on. And this can easily be converted into a software because 
when you look at this straight machine diagram, this has only one meaning. It does not give a feeling of ambiguity. And the advantage is that if there are any errors, you can easily identify it based on simulations. You need not wait until the software is developed for the system. You can simulate the state machines. You can see if the stakeholder requirements are reflected in my systems. If the safety properties are satisfied, the RAMS properties are satisfied, you can test it. You can test it with the help of validation, various things. We use formal methods as well. So the advantage here is that we can also perform a uh, safety verification. And also in uh, addition, uh, we have developed a software as part of our research and development that could automatically transform a state machine into a fully formal model. So we will get to what is a formal model and how it is done in, in later stages. So now you have a clear idea of what Ulink specifies and how it is different from the current day scenario, let's say the present day scenario. So Ulink does not, now it's up to you. So you have two types of specification in front of you. So you have a model-based specification and a text-based specification. As a software developer, let's imagine you are a software developer. Which one would you choose? So I'm sure most of you would choose the, the diagrams because it is unambiguous. So earlier I talked about the four uh, aspects of a specification. It must be comprehensive, consistent, uh, correct, and unambiguous. So if you apply these aspects to text, uh, many of you would say, okay, I would personally say that it is, I would not agree to it completely. But if you look at the MBSE, it is comprehensible, it is correct, it is consistent. Even if you break down the state machine into substates, we, we ensure that uh, the consistency is made so that we do not lose any properties of the high abstract level in the refinement layer. So I hope now you have a clear understanding of how Ulinks is different from the current existing text-based specification uh, documents. Now I would like to sum up and I would like to uh, present a video that sums up everything that we discussed so far about Ulinks. What is uh, Ulinks about? The use of formal methods in standardization of interfaces and signaling systems. In Ulinks, the European infrastructure managers standardize the interfaces between signaling subsystems of different suppliers. The adoption of Ulinks will reduce both lifecycle costs and the time to market, which were caused by repetitive developments. Ulinks have developed a reference architecture to define which subsystem has which function and how those subsystems interact across the interfaces. At the core of this signaling system architecture is the interlocking. The interlocking has standardised interfaces to field elements such as points, signals and level crossings. The use of railway signaling systems and their technology continues to evolve. Current systems are a consequence of over a century's experience. These systems have shown to be functioning very reliably. Currently, the technology process is supported by documents with mainly textual information, schemes and diagrams. These documents for development, design and maintenance are challenging to be understood together with today's digital technology. As technology evolves, there is an increasing number of systems and subsystems with unique interfaces. This leads to many possible variations and combinations. The signaling system becomes more complex because of the increasing amount of requirements concerning reliability, availability, maintenance and safety. Also, there are requirements based on laws and from other national and international rules to be taken into account. Interface standardisation, there is no need to harmonise the operational rules of the involved railways. In new links, the input of the requirements of each infrastructure manager is based on use cases. These use cases reflect the distribution of the functions over the various subsystems. And in this way, the use cases also reflect the interfaces. The lifecycle model, sometimes called the V model, is used for the development of railway systems. It is a European standard that describes the system's engineering development process. Using the V-model ensures that the resulting system fulfills all of the requirements in each of the lifecycle phases. The V-model is a simplified representation of the development of a system. The development phase leads to increasingly detailed specifications. 
the realization phase leads to an increasingly integrated system. This includes the route protection, the train protection, and the control technology. Ulynx uses model-based system engineering, MBSE. In this phase, modeling and system engineering expertise is combined with signaling expertise. In the first phase of the SysML modeling process, the infrastructure managers define the appropriate use case descriptions based on their knowledge of signaling principles, the requirements of users and other sources. Once the use cases have been developed, the experts convert the use cases into various SysML model types. The exchange of information is achieved through the use of a series of standardized diagrams, each of them representing a specific model view rather than the text documents used before. Model-based system engineering describes the internal and mutual coherence and behaviour of systems. The use of different types of model views supports the specification, analysis, design, verification and validation of the interface standard. For example, the model view technical subsystem context represents the relevant environment. It gives information about the system boundary and describes the relationships to external interaction partners. The information flows through those interfaces are described and specified in this model. For example, a train detection section can be free or occupied by a train. The messages are shown in chronological order with the use of the model view use case scenarios using SysML sequence diagrams. The inputs and outputs are now clearly specified. A use case may be defined by one or more use case scenarios. The use case scenario describes an operation that is performed by the system interrelated to its environment. This is shown as an interaction between an actor and subsystem whereby defined essential states of the subsystem are used as preconditions. The model view use case definition defines an overview of all use cases and the interrelation to the actors in the subsystem environment. Both the model type essential states of the subsystem and the use case scenarios are refined by executable SysML state machines. This information forms the basis for the virtual prototype of the subsystem to simulate the stimuli and the response behaviour of the system. In this way, the virtual prototype enables the simulation of the verification and validation of the functional subsystem requirements, resulting in the model simulation. This approach avoids unexpected system behaviour in the development, design and probably also in the later phases of the system life cycle and avoids the risk of additional costs caused by ambiguous text-based requirements in legacy specifications. By simulating the behaviour of the modelled functions on the virtual prototype, the specified... Uh, I would like to interrupt and I would like to show you uh... One of the Ulink uh, specific uh, Ulink specification documents. Uh, just a moment. So, as you saw, Ulink's documents consist of diagrams and self-explanatory text uh, supporting those diagrams. So, I would go to one of the uh, generic interface requirements. Abdul, would you like to take some questions? We've got a couple of questions right now from the yes. audience. Sure, maybe we could, uh, it's, yeah, we can take some questions for now, maybe, yeah. Okay, so... Uh, uh, maybe uh, I will show uh, this Ulinx document in, yeah. in a minute, then we can take these questions. Sure, sure. So, yeah, so as you saw in this video, in the video that uh, if you open any specification documents, you see, what you see are diagrams, we call them as SysML diagrams. So this is uh, official document from Ulinx. So all you see is sys state machine diagrams, the block definition diagrams, internal block diagrams, which clearly specifies what information is available at the interface and how this is what is uh, what is the output of this uh, system blocks, and the behavior of these blocks are specified by state machines. So this is what the suppliers would receive from Ulinks for in order to or let's say manufacture or supply. Uh, the system. It's not just purely text-based. So as you see, sequence diagrams, uh, the block definition diagrams, which is unambiguous, and it clearly tells you the, the type of the data being exchanged, when it is exchanged, the guards, conditions, etc. Yeah, then uh, I think we can take some questions now. So, uh, okay, I'll start with some, some questions right now. So, uh... Okay, so we have a question from Thompson. He's asking, does Ulinx insist to use MBSC? Is mm -hmm. it an imperative? Uh, 
in Ulinx uh, uses MBSC and it recommends uh, MBSC based specification because uh, if you, if I tell you the future railway systems will be designed based on MBSC because the era of the pen and paper is is will end soon because the future of railway systems how it's being because you know the systems are evolving because we want to use the computers and the applications to design the systems. And we want to identify the errors in advance. So how do you, the question that comes back to you is how do you identify errors? Or let's say, how do you simulate it? How do you, let's say, create a digital twin of a text-based specification? It is possible, but the errors that you would eventually identify when the software is developed. So Ulinx uses SysML and it recommends the usage of MBSC for specifications. Okay, thank you. Uh, so Surjit is asking if we use the common SCI method between mm -hmm. various kinds of subsystems, and then what about safety and security measurements? Uh, so as I said, we have the Rasa protocol. So the Rasa protocol is specifically designed for railway application based on the European standards. So the safety and the security is taken care of by the underlying protocol. So we use the standards and we implement the standards. And we can also perform the safety verification with the help of formal methods. So we get into a bit detail in the upcoming slides, how we apply formal methods for safety verification, or let's say the uh, safety property verification. Okay, thank you. Amol is asking, is Ulinx similar to Capilla? Any difference between them? Of course, <laughs> there are two different worlds. Uh, Ulinx uh, specifies the requirements uh, for, let's say, the requirements between two communicating systems in, uh, in the railway signaling. But Capella is, a, uh, is an application that uses model based systems engineering. So I would say, uh, to, you know, just to complete the picture, Ulinx is an initiative that uses uh, MBSC, and the language that we use is uh, SysML. We also have a project called RCA, the Reference CCS Architecture. So RCA uses Capella as an application to, perf to apply MBSC. So Capella is an application to apply MBSC, but Ulinx is an initiative that, that uh, let's say, provides specification documents based on MBSC. So MBSC is a, it's a big, area. So how you apply MBC could be with various modeling languages. So I can say SysML is a semi-formal modeling language. Capella is used for the Arcadia methodology. It's an application. We also use it uh, in uh, RCA. We will get to Capella as well. But yeah, it's, it's not the same. It's different. I would say uh, RCA is a project that uses Capella. Ulinx is a project that uses SysML as an application. Thank you, Abdul. Uh, next question, Dr. Hamant is asking, have the European signaling OEMs like Thales, Siemens have agreed to implement the system? Yes. The answer is yes. And we have, uh, I think we have, uh, we will discuss about the ongoing projects and who are the suppliers dealing with the Ulinx application, Ulinx uh, specification documents. Okay. Uh, Pramod is asking is Ulinx combination of hardware and software or only software? Uh, Ulinx is not combination of hardware and software. Uh, Ulinx specifies the requirements. What is what are needed for, let's say, uh, I would say, yeah, hardware and software. So Ulinx is an interface between two hardwares. So it will be um, a bridge between the two softwares controlling the systems. Uh, Ajit is asking, has Ulinx delivered any project in Asia or Europe? Uh, we are currently working uh, with one of the suppliers in India, uh, Gigitronics. We will discuss the details in the upcoming slides. Okay, thank you. I think we uh, now the last question we'll take and then we can resume the session. So what is the difference between ERTMS and Ulinx? Amul is so, a, yeah. Uh, ERTMS is a, uh, it's a traffic management system. That, that's how uh, tra the railway traffic is in Europe, in Europe. But Ulinx specifies how the information is communicated. So let's say the ERTMS states that, okay, the interlocking will communicate with the level crossing. The, the interlocking communicates with the point machine, but ERTMS do not specify what are the how the messages should be exchanged. So here comes Ulinx that specifies on what basis the command to raise the level crossing is communicated between interlocking and level crossing. Thank you, Abdul. You may continue with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So we will con system con behavior. Continue this video and we proceed with the other slides. The use of formal methods in standardization of interfaces of signaling systems. 
In Ulinx, the European infrastructure managers standardise the interfaces between signalling subsystems of different suppliers. The adoption of Ulinx will reduce both lifecycle costs and the time to market, which were caused by repetitive developments. Ulinx have developed a reference architecture to define which subsystem has which function and how those subsystems interact across the interfaces. At the core of this signalling system architecture is the interlocking. The interlocking has standardised interfaces to field elements such as points, signals and level crossings. The use of railway signalling systems and their technology continues to evolve. Current systems are a consequence of over a century's experience. These systems have shown caused by ambiguous text-based requirements in legacy specifications. By simulating the behaviour of the modelled functions on the virtual prototype, the specified system behaviour can be tested. The results of the model simulation make it possible to compare the resulting reactions from the virtual prototype to the expected test results, the functionalities and the SysML models. This method makes the system comprehensible. It makes evaluation of the system possible and it provides an intuitive user interface. It facilitates communication and sharing of ideas with all users. The model simulation helps to reduce design errors in the early phases and that allows cost savings in the long term. The model simulation also helps early automated verification and validation of the system functions. These tools are used to demonstrate the functionality to the infrastructure managers. Apart from simulation, the aim is to be able to use state-of-the-art computer science techniques to furnish mathematical proofs that the interface specification meets all requirements. Two infrastructure managers who are partners of Ulinx have asked two universities to start research on this. These two universities have developed a formal modelling language and an associated high-performance toolset, which are especially suitable for analysing the quality of the system designs. They perform a mathematical proof based on national knowledge and the typically used national specific subsystems of the two infrastructure managers. Such a mathematical proof is executed using formal methods as a complement to system testing so as to ensure correct behaviour of complex systems. First, the SysML models are translated into the formal modelling language. This translation requires that the models are correct and complete. This is extensively verified using mathematical and automated tools. Being thorough now saves time and money later. Furthermore, a relation is established between national requirements and the U-Link standard. And finally, it can be tested using the formal model to determine whether products comply to the U-Link standard. The analysis of the formal model derived from the SysML model gives IM's mathematical confidence that the U-Link standard is fit for purpose with national subsystems. The use of formal methods is an important step for the future of signalling. It will serve the next generation of signalling engineers. The railways involved will profit from the results by using the methodology and tools in their quality assurance processes. The progress and results will be disseminated through publications in the relevant journals. Yeah, so here we are at the end of uh, the Ulinks video. Now let's have a deeper look into the underlying standards based on which Ulinks uh, is defined. So as I said, Senelec standard EN50126 uh, um, uh, is a standard based on which Ulinks has been designed. So it follows the V model. So we have Senelec phases defined in the standard. So Senelec is a European Committee for Electrotechnical Standardization. And uh, this standard specifies the uh, reliability, the RAMS requirements, and also the specification. And yeah, so here we start with the concept, the stakeholder requirements, then we have the system definition. So we use SysML language. So when I say SysML language, it could be any of these SysML diagrams. So a diagram is, itself is not a complete model. So based on the requirement, we use appropriate uh, diagrams for specifying the system, then the risk analysis is performed, system requirements are specified, detailed design. And and each layer, we make we validate the system requirements, the stakeholder requirements are satisfied by the system or not. So this is being, uh, this is the V model. And once the implementation is completed, then we have the integration test and validation followed by system verification and validation and operation and maintenance. Here is the MBSC Spain, uh, uh, specification framework of Ulinx. So here we have a very uh, simplified uh, framework. So starting the first step in this framework is that we specify the system model based on user requirements and also the stakeholder requirements. 
And in the second step, we refine and decompose the system model into subsystems and further decompose the complex systems again into smaller subsystems. And in the third step that we verify the consistent refinement. Uh, it means that whenever we break down a system, a complex system into smaller subsystems, we have to ensure that the properties are properties are not lost. So that so the properties satisfied by a higher level system should also be satisfied by a lower underlying system. I mean the the decomposed systems. And in the next step, we validate the stakeholder intentions. We make sure that the stakeholder intentions are completely reflected in the SysML model. Then we perform the proof, the, uh, the formal uh, proof of user requirements, also safety requirements using, again, our formal methods. Then we use domain knowledge and MPSC as a basis for specification, verification, and validation tasks. So this is the framework that we follow in ULINS. Sorry. Yeah, so here we are. So you can see here the start of the framework is the uh, design of system architecture. So the, we start with an analysis model. So to, uh, to specify the analysis model, we use Capella. So as our, uh, one of the participants asked earlier, what is uh, Capella? So Capella is again an MBSC tool that we use to uh, reflect the stakeholder requirements, to capture a very high level requirements what the stakeholder wants. But uh, I don't know uh, if, if you have used couple, it's very simplistic. It follows Arcadia methodology, which defer, decomposes a complex system into further uh, lower layers. And after, once the Capella model is created, then we have the Euling specification model, that is a SysML specification model, which specifies the behavior, the internal behavior using the SysML uh, modeling language. Then we have the formal specification model that performs the safety verification and the formal verification of the properties of the model. Just to remind you again, uh, in SysML, we can simulate and validate the system, but with using formal methods, we can verify that the system, are free of, system is free of errors and uh, we can provide confidentiality, uh, let's say a confidence in our system based on mathematical proof. And you can see the, the dotted line. So this is the interface between the infrastructure manager and supplier. So what's above the dotted line is performed by the infrastructure manager. And you can see the standard exchange format that are provided to the suppliers is the SysML standard. So the SysML document that you saw earlier is provided to the supplier. So it's, it could be any suppliers. So the suppliers refer to the uh, requirement specification documents and they can do what they usually do, uh, generate code, produce softwares, produce hardwares, and they supply to the industry. And one major aspect that I would like to um, uh, talk about is, let's say, Instead of the model-based approach, let's say we have the text-based approach. So what uh, the supplier receives is a text document. And the number of iterations that would, or let's say the exchanges or error correction or feedback that would happen between the infrastructure managers and suppliers would be significantly lower if you use the MBSC methodology. Because you would identify errors well in advance if you use model-based systems engineering, which is not possible with text-based. So it reduces the time to market, reduction of time means reduction of cost. So you have a win-win situation when you use the MBSC uh, methodology. So, and yeah, here is again the phases of the Senelec standard. So Ulinks applies the different phases of the Senelec standard. So here we start with the user requirements. Then we have a, a few abstraction levels, so four abstraction levels. So here we have the formalized requirements. So the user requirements are expressed with the SysML diagrams, as we discussed earlier, the many diagrams, which we'll see later. Uh, so abstraction level one refers to the system definition. So here we define the systems. And in abstraction level two, we define the requirements. So the requirements could be uh, defined with the help of behavioral diagrams, such as sequence diagrams and uh, state machine diagrams. And these state machines diagrams can be validated with the help of a virtual prototype. We can simulate the diagrams and see if the, uh, the stakeholder requirements or the user requirements are reflected in the system or not. This is possible. And this V is part of the so the bigger V model. So again, this process is a continuous process and this go, goes on and this is consistent for all the Ulinks interfaces. Yeah, so 
coming to the SysML diagrams. As I said earlier, SysML is an extension of UML. So UML uh, Unified Modeling Language, UML 2.0. Again, there are similarities and there are differences. As you can see here, the SysML diagram. So one with, uh, for example, the sequence diagram, state machine diagram, use case diagram, and package diagram. There are diagrams even the UML standard, but the, the the thick border ones, for example, activity diagram, block definition diagram, these are slightly modified from UML diagram to, uh, to meet the needs of, uh, let's say, uh, railway applications or let's say SysML based applications. And the dotted ones are the new diagrams introduced only for SysML uh, uh, systems modeling language. So requirement diagram, this does not exist in the UML standard. So now you can see the difference between UML standard and a SysML standard. So the differences in diagram and a diagram itself is not a model. It, it's merely a one view of the model. So it contributes to the overall model. And a diagram is, we start, uh, let's say a diagram represents a viewpoint to be in, in simple terms. And the current status, so the current status of u -Links is that on this year in the month of May, we published the fourth baseline. So we had baseline one with five releases, baseline two with five releases. Similarly, so the, we have the fourth baseline and uh, this baseline includes the generic specification that cover the independent management of PDI connections that separate from the Rasta layer. So earlier this was not present in the u -Links, then this has been an improvement. And then this also covers the IT security aspects uh, based on, again, another U or European standard, so EN50159 network uh, standard. So this include the, the latest release includes uh, the IT security aspects as well. So just to give you, coming to the ongoing projects in Germany based on u -Links baseline three. So what we released now this year was baseline four and earlier was the baseline three. And now we have some ongoing projects. So we have a high speed projects uh, and the supplier who deals with this projects is Pinch and it's planned for opera start operation in 2023. This is again in Germany. So it's a place in Switzerland. And other one is the high speed project Gera Weisslist, which is planned for operation in 2024. And uh, one thing is that Neo Wendy is part of this Gera Weisslist project. We provide expertise for domain knowledge. Also, the we support the Hitachi Rail uh, in, in, in let's say giving in depth into our national requirements and also the interlocking subsystem requirements. So Neo Wendy is involved in this project. And the other one is the high speed project again in Lichtenfels, and it's taken care, it's being commissioned by Alstom and starting operation in 2024. And we have a digital note in Stuttgart, and the supplier who is participating in this project is Thales. So all these projects are based on U Links, or let's say U Links compatible. And we have one in operation in 2022 already. So this is actually based on Ulings baseline one in Mertingen, Meitingen, again, uh, taken by Thales. So earlier we had a colleague who asked the question whether the Ulings specifications are being used by the suppliers in Europe. So I would say yes. So here you can see the location of the, where these projects are located in Germany and the corresponding supplier who is dealing with the project. So we have Hitachi Rail, Alstom, Pinch, and Thales using uh, U-Link's uh, requirement specification. Now, to make things more clear, let's say in all these five locations, we have, let's say, we want they want to implement uh, the interface between the interlocking and point machine. All the suppliers would be receiving the same document. The same document that is, uh, as we saw earlier, a Ulink specification document consisting of state machine diagrams, sequence, uh, sequence diagrams, block definition diagrams, etc. So this is the standard that is Ulink is aiming at. So all sub, irrespective of the supplier, we provide uh, standardized interfaces. Yeah, coming to the projects in India. So. For the last three years, uh, German infrastructure manager Deutsche Bahn is in constant communication with the Indian Railway Ministry. So we had a meeting in InnoTrans 2018. Uh, uh, colleagues from railway, uh, Indian Railway Ministry participated and they were uh, interacted with the Ulings colleagues. Since then, the Indian Railway uh, Ministry is interested in integrating Ulings in Indian railways. 
And this has, this has been happening for the last three years. And this year, uh, Indian Railways, I think, you know about Gigi Tronic, most of you. Um, I saw, uh, 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 we have, uh, I think Gigi Tronic is one of the supplier for Indian Railways. And uh, Gigi Tronics approached uh, us to provide support because Gigitronics provi provides the systems for this uh, TCAS, the indigenous TCAS systems, as we discussed earlier, which is a equal, which is equivalent to ETCS level two, also for the coverage project. So they want to uh, integrate U-Links. When I say integrate U-Links, the systems being manufactured or supplied, they want to make it U-Links compliant. So Neovendi provided them with the infrastructure, let's say the tools, the domain support for, let's say right now we are in the, pro uh, in, in the process of testing the RASA protocol and we provided the application for Gigitronics, which can be tested, you know, we also provided the domain support, how this can be validated and integrated. And also we provided the ULINX documentation, ULINX domain uh, expertise, and uh, we, it's still ongoing with Gigitronics. So I would say ULINX has already entered the Indian market. I also, uh, it's you can expect more suppliers integrating units because that's the future because standardization is a future you cannot just depend on one supplier for providing you the systems so again i uh, do not want to go in detail due to the time constraint so again uh, this is what we are testing currently with gigitronics so we provided the, the application for testing and verification Coming to the RCA, uh, to RCA project. So until now, Ulinks deals with the interfaces between the interlocking and the uh, and the let's say the field elements. So what about what's the, the complete railway signaling architecture? What about the other uh, components? So that's where RCA comes into the picture. So RCA is again an initiative by members of EUG. Uh, EUG is the ERTMS users group and Ulinks. So the goal is to define as harmonized architecture for future railway CCS with substantial increase of performance and uh, lowering the life cycle cost. And RCA uses ULIMS interfa uh, interfaces and it, de it defines a clean target architecture without legacy systems. So again, we use MBSC and RCA project uses this tool, uh, Capella MBSC tool for uh, specifying the requirements on a very, very high level requirements. And it also brings in new technology and ensures that the technolo technological progress from other domains, from the automotive industry, from aerospace industry, because we have uh, companies participating in RCA, let's say the ERTMS user group and also a few infrastructure managers. So here are the partners participating in the RCA project. So apart from the ULINX members, we have uh, ERTMS users group and some of the ongoing national programs that contribute to RCA. Uh, so from Switzerland, uh, we have Smart Trail 4.0 project. From Germany, we have this Digital Sheena Deutschland project. And then we have Network from Network Rail, we have the Digital Railway. From Italy, we have the uh, Programma Nazionale ERTMS. So all these projects work closely together to contribute to RCA and they make use of RCA specifications. So we have a modeling standard specified by RCA. So we call it the Capella modeling standard or in short Capstan, which is being used by all the infrastructure managers for contributing to RCA project. So here is the system scope. Um, okay, maybe I move to the next slide. So what RCA aims is, let's say here is the current scenario, how the rail, let's say, uh, we, if you look at the harmonization, so we have the different layers, it's not harmonized, so dependencies and the product architecture. What RCA would like to introduce is that at different, at various levels, there are standardized, uh, harmonized interfaces and standardized interfaces. And uh, different layers of RCA. So we have, so what you see in the yellow boxes are within the scope of RCA. So we have moment control, safety control, object abstraction, device abstraction, and device control. I think it will be more clear if you look at this architecture. So the RCA logical architecture. So here, this is what uh, RCA is all about. So it's a bigger picture and ULINX is a, a small portion of RCA. As you can see here, this is where ULINX is uh, aligned or related to RCA. Here we have a fixed object transactor communicating with uh, the field elements. So the TDS system, the point machine, level crossing and generic IO. So we have a bigger picture and 
we uh, RCA would specify, I think RCA is in a very early stages, so we do not have the complete uh, specification for all the interfaces, but as we progress, I think we have made significant improvement in the RCA uh, project over the last two years. So just uh, uh, zoomed up view of the U-Links interfaces within RCA architecture. So these are the interfaces that RCA uses, SCI GDS, SCIP, SCI LC. And of course, RCA supports the existing standards, so ERTMS standards. RCA is based on availability of the, the successor to GSMR. So we have uh, uh, currently the 5G test ongoing in, in, in Germany. RCA uses U-Links and RCA will also incorporate the results of ATO or ETCS, automatic train operation. And uh, short video RCA in a nutshell. that would explain uh, details about RCA. Uh, uh, it would summarize the RCA project for you. Oh. European rail infrastructure managers must optimize cost, availability, safety, capacity, and fast migration. Assets must be renewed when new technologies are introduced. To increase capacity and performance without costly changes in track topology or physical infrastructure extensions, investments in control, command and signaling CCS, are necessary. Digital technology is rapidly changing our everyday life. It provides an opportunity for railway improvement and enhancement in safety, capacity, reliability, and service. This cannot be reached with traditional technology and processes. At the same time, investments and maintenance cost can be reduced significantly. The increase in traffic demands requires centralized traffic management and safety control. Higher costs arise when incompatibility between different systems or different supplier systems occur. National solutions lead to small markets with unique and bespoke interfaces. RCA provides a framework for harmonization and migration based on infrastructure managers' current systems. This will lead to significant savings and greater efficiency of the rail system in Europe. Our current rail network can be considered as a comprehensive digital data pool with real-time information. Up-to-date digital information processing and trains that are always connected and always fully supervised ensure optimum rail operations. Exchangeable modules communicate with each other according to modern industrial standards. Control, command and signalling contains major innovations, the so-called game changers, which have significant impact on rail business. They can be found in traffic management, automatic train operation and future communication systems. Some already exist in suburban rail systems. Trains become more intelligent and offer relevant safety information about their location and moving position, actual speed and braking characteristics. This must result in higher performance and lower life cycle costs of the rail infrastructure, which is reinforced by a decrease of trackside equipment. To sum up, RCA brings centralized traffic and safety control, real-time data, exchangeable modules, always connected intelligent trains, and always safely localized trains together in one common, simple, reference CCS architecture, RCA. RCA supports migration from different existing national configurations to a more performing control, command and signalling. This allows upgradable ambition levels based on a modular architecture for infrastructure managers. Knowledge of existing standards like ERTMS is reused and ready to record in the game changers. 
the interchangeability of components by interface standardization and information, as provided by ULINKS, are continued in RCA. RCA reduces life cycle costs for the entire CCS system of infrastructure managers by providing a standardized European reference architecture. Less costly products can be compensated by higher production volumes. Without delay, planned projects can start with proven technology as part of the national migration strategy. New innovative and open European applications will occur from suppliers whose products fit into the reference CCS architecture. With RCA, the arrow hits the target. Yeah, so that was all about RCA. I hope it's clear to all. Now, let's sum up. Uh, what are the benefits of Ulings RCA? I think most of you must know now uh, the benefits. So first is the modularity. Uh, it prevents the vendor lock. So you're not bound with one supplier for maintenance, procurement. You know, sometimes you end up in a long-term contract that's uh, avoided. Other one is lower life cycle costs. So once you separate the life cycle of individual systems, of course, the cost is lowered in, when, it, when you want to upgrade or renew systems. Uh, reduce project uh, delay risk. So once the systems are safe and secure and it's commercial off the shelf, uh, then uh, there, there, are, there are no risks of project delay. Software and hardware independence, uh, easier upgradability of software and hardware. So as I said earlier, if you want to upgrade in individual systems, that's possible with the uh, U-Links or RCA approach. It does not depend on the other uh, infrastructure, railway infrastructure. Faster adaptation of uh, new technology. As you know, it, the simple thing, uh, simple ways, as you can see in this picture. So what you see on the right is that uh, you know the task is being performed, and how Ulinks would optimize this task is just by using the round wheels instead of the square wheels. That's how you can relate it to the current scenario and how Ulinks and R RCA architecture, let's say RCA approach, would bring into the railway uh, domain. So just a brief look into the tool chain that we use. So for SysML modeling, we use application called a winch, PTC windshield modeler. So here, here we have uh, different uh, SysML diagrams, which is very well integrated with IBM rational doors, which, uh, which helps us to produce these documents in a PDF format. And also the request file can be generated automatically. And the windshield modeler allows us to generate the C code, also the XML file. So everything that can be done with computers. And we also use the XML extracted from the SysML model for automatic transformation of the SysML model into a fully formal model. And PTC windshield model also supports Visual Studio, C++. Uh, we also use uh, the extension, the SciSim extension for simulation of the uh, models. And coming to verification validation. So here we can see a screenshot of some of the, so this is a state machine and how this is simulated in a virtual prototype, as you can see on the right-hand side. So this is again supported and we have the model in the loop, which we test this model with the real hardware. And with the help of formal methods, we perform the safety uh, formal specification and verification. So in simple terms, the formal methods or let's say formal methods refers to a uh, specifying system in a mathematical language and we can perform the mathematical proof. So this is what it basically means. So we have the SysML model that is converted into a mathematical model and we perform the safety verification. And once the errors are identified, so we make the necessary changes in the SysML model directly. So we do not have to wait until the software is produced to make the necessary changes. We can do that in the design phase itself. So this is the advantage of uh, using formal methods. Again, uh, here we have the windshield size modeler, the MS Visual Studio extension, uh, again, the, the simulation environment, et cetera. Yeah, for formal verification. Uh, so we here we have the input. The input to this formal verification is the SysML state machines. So here we have multiple uh, state machines that we have tested already. So for the SCI LX interface has been subjected to formal verification. 
the interface to the point machine has been subjected already, and we could apply the same methodology for any uh, interface requirements. So in first, we have the SysML model and we convert them into a formal model. So this is done with the help of an application called Rodin platform and we perform. So we, I do not want to go in detail to the application, how it is done. And then we have the safety requirements, which are verified mathematically in this Rodin platform. And this can also be animated and validated. So basically what we are trying to do is we are trying to make sure that the system that will be developed in future is free from errors, satisfies the safety requirements, satisfies the user requirements and all other important properties. So we can get a mathematical proof as well. So we do not just say it, we can, we can actually prove it with mathematics. Then again, next we have the model in the loop uh, 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 technique where we test the SysML model together with the hardware. So the real hardware, or let's say the PLCs. So we configure the, the software and deploy the software in a PLC. And we test if models can simulate the real hardware in an IoT platform, we use the PTC ThingWorks as a virtual testbed. Here are some of our publications from NeoWendy and Ulinks, uh, based on Ulinks. So these are, we were part of uh, multiple conferences and we have a few publications available. Yeah, now I would like to give a, a short overview of our Ulinks MBSC training and what we cover uh, in Ulinks MBSC training, what are the contents. So in Ulinks MBSC training, we start, we train, uh, let's say the, the, the training program focuses mainly on the MBSC aspects. So all the modeling aspects that we use for Ulinks modeling. So we start with the state, stakeholder needs, the user needs, and we capture the stakeholder needs using the Capella platform. So it's an MBSC platform, uh, which we use in RCA and also in the Ulinx approach. Once we have the analysis model based on the Arcadia methodology, we prepare the SysML specification model using VTC windshield model. So for this, we use the SysML uh, language. And from SysML language, we from SysML state machines, we generate the mathematics. So I talked about formal model. So this is how an analysis model looks like. This is how a SysML specification model looks like. And this is how a formal model looks like. All correspond to the same requirements, but for different levels of abstraction. So here we have the analysis or the requirement specification. And here we have a formal model. And in the end, once everything is uh, done, make sure the system is free of errors. With the help of IBM Rational Doors, we export the Ulinks, or let's say we publish the Ulinks uh, official documents. That those are nothing but the standardized requirement specification documents. So this is the overview again uh, of the MBSC training. So in MBSC training, we cover the model MBSC aspects of analysis model. So how to create an analysis model, what are the applications that we use, what are the methodologies that we use for creating analysis model, and the tool will be Capella. And uh, we cover how to create a SysML model, different types of SysML diagrams, uh, how this can be applied, how this uh, SysML diagrams can be simulated, uh, exported, etc. We also cover the formal mod, formal um, methods aspect. So how to create a formal model, not in depth, but uh, short overview so that anyone could interpret, okay, this is how formal methods works, what are the advantages of formal methods and how we perform the safety verification. And eventually the safety, uh, the standard exchange format is SysML. And this is what the suppliers would get, even if irrespective of the country, if the supplier from India or supplier from Europe, they would eventually get the U-Links uh, SysML uh, specification document. Uh, I would like to give a quick, peek into the Ulinks, or let's say the, our MBSC training program, a quick overview, maybe just a moment while it loads. Yeah, so who, who, who can attend or let's say who can take this MBSC training are the target group are railway engineers, railway project managers or students. And one important aspect is that you do not need prior knowledge about railways or MBSC to take up this basic MBSC training. And it is a five-day training. So, in, so this is a detailed uh, description of what we cover in day one. So in day one, we cover about more in detail about the projects such as RCA Okora and the systems modeling language. 
And in day two, we have the part two of the service systems modeling language. And, and this includes practical sessions. So hands-on sessions of how to create a model step-by-step -step procedure, how to uh, simulate it. And in day three, we have the hands-on experience with the Ulinx methodology, PTC windshield modeler, verification, validation, and continued in day four. And in day five, we have the de demonstration and automation, automatic transformation of a system model into a fully formal model. So day five mainly focuses on application of formal methods. So this is available in our website, also part of this presentation. Uh, sorry. Yeah, and here are some of our partners whom we work closely with uh, near Wendy. So we uh, mainly we work with the Deutsche Bahn uh, Railway Academy, and from Indian market we work with the Gigitronics, as we know, for the TCAS project as well as the Coverage project. And we have contributions to the ongoing Shift to Rail program, Europe's Rail program, and also with suppliers uh, Hitachi Rail, uh, Scheidung Bachmann, also Frausche. So these were these are some of our right? now coming to the career opportunities. You must you, you now you must be uh, you must have understood what are the career opportunities by now because every step in Ulinx methodology there is a career opportunity. Let's say with respect to the domain knowledge, with respect to the uh, the tech system engineering part, the model based system engineering part, the project management part. Everywhere we need we lack uh, let's say the upcoming market. The railway market is dependent on let's say engineering. So in, from in the field of engineering we have a high demand. Let's say there's a demand for software developers. There's a demand for model-based system engineer, model-based system engineers, uh, testers, validation engineers, formal methods experts. So this creates opportunities for uh, for these domains. Not only that, you know, uh, in the when the railway systems, let's uh, let's say the systems are controlled by software. So the software industry is big, and the future railway systems. Trust me, this will be built based on models and softwares. That's that's the future, as you can see already. Automatic tra uh, train operation, which we already commissioned in Germany uh, this year, earlier this year, in Hamburg, the first uh, passenger operation for passenger train operation based on automatic train operation. So a lot of career opportunities based on U-Links, also the standardization projects, et cetera. Yeah, that brings us to the uh, end of our presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, I think we can you know, uh, take some questions if you have. So next 20 minutes we have for Q&A. Abdul, I have uh, noted a few questions which I'd like to ask you. So uh, let me just uh, share the screen, please. So as you've covered some of the uh, points here in your presentation, but just to make it more concise and focused. So uh, mm -hmm. how do you see Ulinks rolling out in India? And how do you see Ulinks getting relevant in Indian context? This is something that we, a lot of participants today wanted to know. I agree. I think, uh, yeah, I think Ulinx is very relevant in Indian context. One question that I would like to ask, you know, to the participants, why wouldn't you support standardization? Because why would you want to be in a vendor lock? Why would you want, why you do not want to identify, let's say, why you would want to rely on text-based requirements? I think that's the future. I know in India, I think currently we have multiple metro projects taken up by European suppliers, Alstom. What I mean to say is the principles of operation remains the same, but it doesn't mean that we have only one supplier. Let's say we, maybe we want a signaling equipment from one supplier and other one from different supplier. Why not? Why? It's, why? Because the future is standardization because that would cause save costs. Let's say the metro corporations in India, they all come together. Let's say, okay, it's time that we you know to lower the cost you know, to, for, the, for the efficiency of operations. Let's have a standard on based on which the suppliers would uh, would uh, manufacture their systems. And one in, uh, important aspect is Indian railways. They have already shown a lot of interest uh, in dualings. We have we have had multiple meetings with RDSO colleagues uh, based out of IIT uh, IIM I think IIT Roorkee. So we were I think. Um, the research organization in based in Lucknow showed interest in Ulinx. And in future, Indian railways would like to consider Ulinx compatible systems in Indian railway for Indian railways. So Gigitronics is one of the examples. So 
In future, yes, I would say the Indians, let's say the signaling systems in India would not be based on Ulinks, but it would be Ulinks compliant. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Abdul, for this wonderful insight. So I think you've already covered the career and growth opportunities, but still I would like to ask a very uh, specific question here. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, uh, for, uh, for a non-railway uh, background person, or mm -hmm. even for a railway background person, the, the Ulinks uh, more or less looks like, a, like a, an opportunity which will be more harnessed by software people compared to the core uh, railway engineers. Mm -hmm. uh, am I correct here or you'd like to moderate this? No, uh, I would like to give you a scenario. Imagine uh, today in today's world, uh, how, it, the, how the system development happens is a domain expert sits, sits with the modeling expert. So the modeling expert do not know the domain knowledge of railway signaling and the railway signaling engineer do not know the technical aspects. So they sit together and they try to model the systems based on, they communicate with each other. But in future, what Ulinks aims is to have is a railway engineer who can do the modeling. And trust me, it is not difficult to learn model-based systems engineering. Uh, I would say within a few months of training, uh, anyone without prior knowledge of model based let's say not even you don't have to be a software engineer to do model based systems engineering you don't have to be a let's say a railway engineer to be a, anyone can take up model based systems engineering not just railway engineers not just computer scientists and uh, we have a program i think in, in germany in also in deutsche bahn we have students from universities they are fresh from uh, they are basically from different backgrounds so project management and uh, computer science background mechanical background and trust me, within the span of four months, they have been successfully applying MBSC for various railway projects. So it's not specific to computer scientists or computer software, or let's say the software domain, it is generic. It, and MBSC that is being introduced by Ulinks, it's not very difficult to interpret. As you know, I just showed you some of the diagrams, even a person without prior knowledge about computer science, I'm pretty sure he or she would, understand or interpret basic things such as sequence diagrams. It is not difficult, I would say. Okay, thank you, Abdul. Uh, another question which I'd like to ask that, uh, uh, if, uh, so do you see Ulinks opening up growth opportunities for Indian companies and professionals in the global railway industry around Ulinks or, uh, so, is my question clear to you? Yeah, uh, at the moment, yes, in Ulinks, uh, and as it is defined, uh, only the infrastructure managers in Europe are partners. When I say partner or members, they can contribute and maintain. But in Ulinks, there is a concept called associate partners. And we are expecting, expecting uh, associate partners outside the European, uh, outside Europe. And why not? If Indian Railways says, okay, we, Indian Railways use ETCS. So ETCS is not only for India, it's a European train communication system, so ETCS. If India, Indian Railway uses ETCS, then why not U-Links in future? Because in, in Europe, of course, now companies have suppliers have already started manufacturing system based on U-Links. Earlier, ETCS was only in Europe, but now ETCS is all over the world. If you look at the same context, of course, I see a future of U-Links being followed even in India, but not, I would say not immediately, but it would take time because uh, I would say a few years at least. Yeah, I, I would, and not only that, uh, the suppliers working in the Indian market are mainly from Europe, if you see, Alstom, Hitachi Rail, Ansaldo STS, Siemens. So the major players who are in the manufacturing industry or supply, they are already aware of Ulinks. They know what is Ulinks. So even if you introduce Ulinks compliant systems in the Indian railway market, it is not difficult for the suppliers to integrate, not only just India, anywhere in the world. And uh, in addition to Indian market, we have a CSRC. So it's Chinese rail communicators. Uh, I think CSRC is the, uh, um, the Chinese railways where which have shown interest in introducing Ulinks. So it's not, uh, what I would like to say, uh, focus on is uh, Ulinks is not being followed or maybe the, uh, the companies have shown interest even outside Europe. But at the moment I can say Indian railways, Chinese railways, yeah. Okay, uh, what would you advise to Indian companies who plan to gear up to harness Ulinks opportunities? How should they start? 
they, should they be starting with learning MBSCs or equipping their uh, employees on MBSC and Ulings? Uh, how should they start? What should be the starting point? Uh, the starting point is understand the standardization. So understand the requirements, what is needed. Because what was needed in Europe was that it was the cost was so high, it was so high that the infrastructure managers found it difficult to sustain the uh, sustain the maintenance. So what they said decided is they came together, they sat and discussed. Okay, this what are the things that can be standardized? Similarly, if Indian railways or let's say the company, firstly uh, focusing on the Indian infrastructure managers, if they come together and they sit together and discuss, okay, these are the things that we want to improve. How, how about we sit together and discuss what are the things that can be standardized? I'm sure there could be a significant percentage of requirements that can be standardized because the principles in railways are the same. But how you apply it, it depends on, on the supplier or, or the requirements. But there is a significant area which has been unexplored. So if you explore this gray area, I think you will find the solution. The Indian, any market will find the solution how you can apply. And one way is to readily integrate because Ulinx has already defined the requirements. One approach is that you can build upon the Ulinx requirements. So how it works in Ulinx is, so let's say, uh, Sweden and Germany, two countries. So 60% of the principles are same, but there are a few specific, um, uh, let me give you an example. Um, for train detections, for train detection, Germany uses uh, axle counters, for example. And uh, Sw uh, Sweden still use track circuits for train detection. They don't use axle counters. But however, u -Links is supposed to support Sweden as well as Germany. So what we do in u -Links is we have variability management. So with the help of IM codes, we can allocate special requirements only for Sweden. And we can allocate special requirements only for Germany. But it does not mean 100% uh, can be uh, harmonized or standardized. No, that's not possible. Even not only in Europe, anywhere in the world. But there are a few a uh, variability management that can be considered in the Indian market, even if. So one thing is you can take Ulinks, Indian railway or Indian market can take Ulinks. They can build upon Ulinks based on the specific requirements of uh, the Indian signaling uh, uh, domain. I'm sure uh, there are various differences. One such example is a TCAS. For TCAS, the principle remains the same, but instead of Belize, they use uh, RFIDs. So this can be uh, managed with variability management in Ulinx. So we have an additional improvement and why not? If in future, maybe Indian railways is also considered for the official Ulinx requirements. It is a possibility. So we have infrastructure manager code for Indian railways. And what does that mean? That means any uh, infrastructure manager, uh, I, mean, I mean, any supplier providing systems to Indian railways complies with Ulinx and with the variability management, they can configure it based on the Indian uh, specific requirements for the Indian market. This is a possibility. Thank you. We have another question uh, from Ajit. Can we convert EDCS level one to L3 using Ulinks? Uh, it's a two different things. I would like to share my screen. So if you see, uh, can you see my screen? Not yet. Oh, sorry. I think I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay. Now, can you see my screen now? Not yet. Not yet. Yes, we can see. Yeah. So what you see, see here is ETCS level one and ETCS level two. Oh, sorry. So the difference in ETCS level one and ETCS level two is that in ETCS level two, we don't have traffic lights or let's say the light signals. It doesn't mean that Ulinks does not use, Ulinks can eradicate the usage of light signals. So what Ulinks specifies here is the Ulinks specifies the requirements how uh, interlocking communicates with the light signal in ETCS level one, for example. And in ETCS level two, what Ulink specifies is, Ulink specifies how the interlocking communicates with RBC, for example. How the interlocking communicates with, uh, let's say there's a level crossing, how it is specified. So I hope you understand the difference. Yes, I think it's clear. It's very much clear uh, from these two slides. 
uh, okay, uh, how Ulinks affects on centralized and non-centralized interlockings in railway systems? That's another question we've got. Uh, centralized and non-centralized. Uh, could you be, be be more specific? Maybe the participant, if you can. Uh, just just a moment. I'll just Amol. Uh, let me just Amol. I'm unmuting you. Please uh, uh, ask your question directly. Hello. Yes, Amol. Yeah, uh, in, uh, I've seen a few regions having a distributed, like a few conventional signalings and speed signalings will be operated in a distributed manner. Mm -hmm. And if in, a, in, a, in, a, in a few systems, they have, in few countries have uh, centralized systems. So if distributed, how it, uh, U-links can be formatted and how to prepare the MBSC tools according to that one. Uh, I would say you can use Ulink specification for distributed as well as uh, non-distributed systems because because what Ulink specifies is uh, is the interface only. So you can use any systems on both sides. So let's say you but, can use a. But it according to country, right? Because in in one country you have mm -hmm. to use in a distributed also, uh, and centralized also, and non-centralized also. In some situations so it may impact or not impact it will not impact but uh, as, you, as i said earlier in ulinks we have variability management so when you apply when you let's say i when i implement ulinks in germany my systems will be configured for germany so when i say for germany this includes the specific requirements applicable only to germany yeah so uh, when you develop it, the systems, it, it, it may be it may be uh, updated according to country levels also, right? Yes, it can be updated according to the country uh, countries. Yeah, because if even, if, if even, I'm applying even, it, yeah, even according to according to your baseline packages also, right? Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Because baselines is uh, basically the improvement. Yes, so yes, if you sure, sure. If you compare the baseline one and baseline four you will see significant differences but significant these differences are basically the the technological differences you know one such example is uh, we use uh, let's say for example in baseline 3 we use uh, flow ports and in uh, flow ports for communication in the modeling uh, tool but in baseline 4 we use a proxy port so proxy port supports two way communication and uh, flow ports uh, support only one way communication so these are the minor improvements and advancements for the same in specification so it does not mean that we replace the the principles so yeah. how it is being applied is improved in every baseline so the next baseline release i think we will have the baseline release four release one very soon uh, i think in uh, very soon i'm not sure about the dates but and uh, as you know my colleague uh, uh, randolph berglin as well he's about 45 years of experience and we are authors of um, a few requirements uh, ulinks requirements specification documents so uh, he's the author so he's here i don't know randolph if you have do you have anything to add on to this uh, uh, for the centralized and decentralized systems. So from your experience uh, with all generations of interlocking systems. Uh, I think uh, uh, I've requested Randolph to unmute himself. Okay, so maybe uh, the unmute button is on the left, bottom left of the screen. Yeah, he's in there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Randall. Ah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, Ulinks, uh, uh, you know, Ulinks uh, um, defines interfaces between uh, the interlocking side and uh, and the field element and as well uh, the, uh, sub the field element subsystem controller. And uh, if you have a, a distributed uh, interlocking system, then uh, you can use, of course, these interfaces. This uh, this makes no difference. It depends. It depends on your architecture. Yeah? Yeah. Because you will always have a, 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 an interface through your field elements. Yeah. Was this your, was this your question, or did I understand your question? Mostly, 
mostly uh, when we are working with uh, many regions and many countries, uh, they have different levels of interlockings they are using in, in their systems according to their country levels. Mm -hmm. So in that uh, situation, uh, U-Links will how interface with the, with comes in one model. Yeah, U-Links defines uh, the U-Links interface. And uh, I know you, uh, we have the problem too. For example, uh, we, uh, we have really, uh, 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 in and so on. We have uh, uh, a U-Links uh, adapter, you know, to this, uh, to this uh, interlocking. So if you have uh, inter interlockings, uh, that uh, uh, and you want to change interlocking logic or somehow that it fits to your links, then you have to use this uh, interface adapters. Yeah, yeah because right, your, right. your interlockings uh, be a compliant links interface. Yes, yeah, sure. And yeah. uh, maybe one aspect more because because it's uh, uh, I think you have also this uh, problem as for example we have here uh, and a different infrastructure manager head. Uh, if you have this Ulinks interface, Ulinks defines an interface that uh, you know um, that uh, fits uh, to all the to all the uh, participating infrastructure managers. Then it it Ulinks delivers the specifications to the infrastructure manager. Abdul, I think, I think, uh, uh, I think we've, uh, Randolph has answered the question. So okay. I would like to add one more point. Does it fit to my interlocking and to my field elements? And uh, if it doesn't fully fit, what's probably the case, then you can adjust it to your world. Uh, and this. Yeah. Uh, Randolph, are you still there? We, we cannot hear you. I think there is some disturbance at Randolph. And yeah, I would like to add on to one, uh, add on one point, you know, to with respect to this variability management, what Randolph explained. So if you look at this state machine, so there are some, as I mentioned something earlier about the infrastructure manager codes. So this 8,000 code you see is is an infrastructure manager code for Germany. So Dutch DB Nets AG. And if you see this interaction, so this is a state machine for point machine interface going for the all right to all left. So, so if you see this uh, interaction or let's say this transition, this is applicable to all infrastructure managers except Germany. So if you apply this uh, uh, SCIP interface, you will not implement a transition from all left to all right in Germany. This transition or uh, this inter, uh, transition will not be present in the software. This is not part of the software specification. It will not be part of it. But if you apply it to any other infrastructure manager, I, I think, I don't know if 8,000 is a, a DB, uh, I think, but except DB, all other infrastructure managers will have this functionality defined in their software. So this is what I refer to the as a variability management. Similarly, you can we can also see some other operation here, which is specific to. Yeah, I think in this op, uh, example, I can see only one. So except Germany, all other infrastructure managers support this transition from all left to all right. I hope this answers the question about the uh, the variability management between different countries. Amul, are you satisfied yeah. with the answer? You you have some follow-up questions with. No, no, I, I got it, my answer. Yeah, yeah. Sure, thank sure. you so much. Thanks. So, uh, Abdul, I think uh, Abdul, I think we can uh, conclude the session today. Okay. Well, then thank you uh, from my side. Thank you very much for taking out time on a weekend. Uh, back to you, uh, Sumit. Oh, so uh, thank you, thank you, everyone, Abdul, Guido, Smith, Randolph, for taking out your time to. Uh, present this wonderful insight on Ulinks.
and uh, i thank you all on behalf of all the participants and uh, so uh, going forward from here if there are any companies or organizations who are looking at understanding u links for their companies in detail they can definitely contact us we'll be happy to schedule a meeting with new nd experts to take the uh, further course of action on this right uh, apart from this uh, i have a request that we planning to uh, organize some uh, training programs in the coming weeks uh, so you can take up a screenshot of these a screen visible to you plus we are also coming up with webinars on in the uh, coverage we coming out on a webinar on uh, rams uh, followed by a webinar on project management uh, so this is the uh, calendar for next 3 to 4 months so if you're interested in uh, free master classes like these please follow our linkedin page and uh, uh, linkedin and uh, youtube to get the notification at the earliest and we look forward to see you in our future training programs as well have a great evening and thank you so much participants uh, thank you thank, thank you very you. much have a nice evening thank you everyone thank you have a nice evening thank you everyone thank you abdul guido you're welcome but thank you so much thank you bye bye thank you thank you very much thank you bye bye thank you